Elsa? You're looking better than I am. Lower the Hi everyone, welcome. On behalf of both the Stimson Center and the Clement Center for National Security, I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Paul Edgar, I'm the Associate Director of the Clement Center and it's a distinct honor to introduce our guests this afternoon who will engage in a conversation that we've titled, It's Not Just Over There, The American Commitment to the Korean Peninsula. Our moderator is Dr. Clint Work. Clint is jointly appointed to the Stimson Center's 38 North program and the Security for a New Century program. He is, of course, an expert on Korea and thus uh, why uh, he's selected as our moderator. Our two featured speakers include the Clement Center's own Dr. Sheena Graytons and General Vince Brooks. Dr. Graytons is a, an associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. She's affiliated with both the Clement Center and the Strauss Center. And to say that Sheena is an expert on Korea is an understatement. Hardly a week passes by that we don't see her quoted at length in the press or sought out by our senior leaders in order to help them un understand a variety of issues. General Brooks, a Clement Center distinguished senior fellow, is a career army officer who recently retired from active duty as the four-star flag officer in command of all US forces in Korea as well as the two parallel commands called the Republic of Korea U.S. Combined Forces Command and United Nations Command. 
Among the various positions he currently holds, he is the president of the Korea Defense Veterans Association. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to, uh, to you, Clint, and uh, you please uh, engage in uh, conversation. We look forward to it. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Paul. And thank you to you, Elizabeth Dowdy, and the entire Clement Center for your partnership on today's timely program. Our program is part of the Stimson Center and 38 North's outreach on Korean peace and security issues outside of the DC Beltway. And due to your efforts at the Clement Center, we have a really nice array of attendees in the Austin area and the state of Texas. So thank you for, for helping us achieve that, that important goal of ours. I just wanna provide a few contextualizing remarks before I, I turn to our speakers. Um, as the audience may be or may not be aware, uh, the Korean War is often referred to as the Forgotten War. Uh, situated between World War II and Vietnam, it often receives sort of short shrift by historians and the US public alike. But in Korea, uh, both North and South, the war is hardly forgotten. It lives on in the political culture and in the familial and psychological fabric of a still divided and heavily militarized peninsula. However, it doesn't just live on in the lives of the Korean people. It's also a quintessentially American story and not something that's just over there. Um, even if it's not foremost in the public consciousness, it was the Korean War that catalyzed the globalized American conception of national security in the early Cold War years and the wide ranging military basing and alliance system that underpinned it. And the U.S. presence in South Korea and commitment to South Korea today remains a, a crucial node within that wider strategic tapestry or architecture. But the war lives on in other ways, too. After all, the war has not ended. Um, this is evident in the Korean War Armistice Agreement, which is a cessation of hostilities rather than a formal peace treaty. But it's also embodied in deeply fixed mindsets in Pyongyang, Seoul, and in Washington, D.C., this is understandable, but the truth is, if we do not begin to collectively re-examine the endless war mindset, it's my feeling that no real progress uh, toward peace or a more stable diplomatic solution is really possible. So the Korean War may, may be deemed forgotten by some, and our attention span toward Korea may be frustratingly episodic, but there are multiple enduring links between the U.S. and the Korean Peninsula, and indeed between the state of Texas and the Korean Peninsula, which I may touch on later. Uh, and we have two outstanding speakers to help us explore some of these links. Uh, now, Paul did some of my work for me up front, um, so I won't run through uh, General Brooks's uh, bio. It's, it's featured on the event notice, but I do wanna mention just a few salient points. Um, his first deployment in Korea, long before he commanded US and Alliance forces was in 1996 to 98 as a battalion commander right up near the DMZ. And years later, after extensive experience at the Pentagon and in the Middle East, he served as commander of US, <clears throat> excuse me, US Army Pacific from 2013 to 16 during the so-called pivot or rebalance to Asia. And then it was in April of 2016 that he, he went to, uh, to Seoul as the four-star commander. Um, during his time there, it was quite eventful, if you might recall. He saw the South Korean executive branch change hands from a conservative to a progressive administration through an impeachment and early election process. He served two different U.S. presidents from opposing parties. And of course, I think as we all remember, he commanded during a, an alarming uptick in North Korea's nuclear and missile testing, and then the sudden shift to historic diplomacy between the U.S. and North Korea and the two Koreas. And furthermore, for 15 of those 30 months, there was not a U.S. ambassador that had been appointed. So we had to serve and sort of stretch beyond traditional military considerations. So we're very pleased to have him here today to share his insight. Uh, and also want to thank uh, General Brooks and KDVA, the Korea Defense Veterans Association, uh, for its continued uh, support for our programming. Um, our next speaker, as has been mentioned, is Dr. Uh, Sheena Chestnut Greitens, and I was going to I was going to say a few things that that Paul already sort of mentioned, so that's okay. That saves me the time. I, I will just say. Um, in addition to all of her expertise and experience that, that Paul rightly laid out, the first time I met Sheena, I think I was trying to pin it down, was in the summer of 2015, I believe, in Seoul. And I think she was putting the finishing touches on her book then. Um, 
and I knew of her then uh, from others, from mutual acquaintances as, as an up and coming academic and analyst. And she's only continued um, her steady, uh, expected, but no less impressive rise in the field. So it's very nice to share um, this virtual panel with you uh, today, Sheena. Um, just quickly, the format of our, of our program today. The first portion will be a semi-structured conversation between myself and our two speakers. And then around the 45 minute mark or so, I'll turn to audience Q&A. Uh, the chat box is disabled for the audience, but the Q&A box is open. So please feel free to enter questions there as we go through our conversation, as they're sparked, um, and we'll queue them up for our Q&A. And I also wanna flag now that during our Q&A, uh, we will pose three polling questions to you, our audience, to get a sense of your collective sentiment on some of the issues that we're, we're going to discuss today. So with that said, without further ado, I wanna to turn to our first topic of discussion, uh, which is North Korea. And I wanna direct the question first to you, General Brooks. Um, and this is a question that I had the good fortune to pose to uh, Generals Scaparati and Sharp, predecessors of yours um, as four-star flag officers on the Korean Peninsula. And it is currently in US-North Korean relations, we're somewhere between the escalatory rhetoric and behavior of 2016 and 17, and the historic sort of hopeful diplomacy of 2018 and early 2019. Where do you see events trending in the coming months and beyond? And as best you can tell, what are North Korea's intentions? What complicates and hinders Kim Jong-un's and the North Korean regime's decision-making? And maybe more immediately, has COVID impacted US-North Korean relations at all? Well, first, uh, Clint, thanks so much for uh, moderating for us today, and it's an honor to be with you. And I thank Paul Edgar and the Clement Center as well, with whom I'm associated and affiliated. I, uh, thanks very much, Paul, for the introduction. And of course, it's a, a, a great privilege to be with uh, Dr. Sheena Chestnut Greitens. Uh, we know each other from before. She came to visit me in Korea. I look forward to carrying on our conversation that we had in my office. We can now carry it on live. Uh, and it was a great conversation. You know, as, as we look at North Korea, I always advise caution on projecting anything uh, as an expected outcome. North Korea is going to surprise us. Now, at the same time, there are some things that are observable that may be signals of where North Korea wants to go. Uh, interestingly, yesterday or earlier today, uh, Kim Jong-un announced an 80-day campaign when he does that, he tends to really focus the attention of the North Korean people on some matter. And while he doesn't always accomplish what he set out to do, he does indeed create a, a harnessing of uh, intellectual attention and uh, public attention, and they move the ball forward in some way or another. Sometimes he does it to keep attention off of other problems, you know, the things that are happening elsewhere in the world or the things that would attract his attention. So I think that this 80-day campaign is the first thing we ought to look at for North Korea. It so happens that the 80 days ends on December 25th. So this is Kim Jong-un's Christmas surprise. It has already begun. Now what that will turn into, who knows? His emphasis is on economic development in areas that have been lagging. And it's very clear that Kim Jong-un still has the desire of pursuing his Byung-jin policy of military capability development, including nuclear weapons, and economic development, with the ascendant one actually being uh, economic development. And because he pursued the, the former, he has not been able to achieve the latter. Uh, can't get the economic development going because of the uh, significant sanctions that have been imposed on him. So for the next 80 days, the sanctions will continue. Uh, there'll be some places where the sanctions are tattered. We can talk about that later, perhaps. Uh, but North Korea will be concentrating internally. That's the message I think that comes out of this. And that is likely to be a function of the great duress that they've been under from sanctions, from flooding, from typhoons, and from COVID all arriving at the same time. And as a result, the hermit kingdom has gone more hermit. And I think that's what we can expect for a while. So COVID clearly has a role in that. Uh, the election cycles in the United States and in the Republic of Korea uh, all have an impact on that. They're, remember, just coming out of elections in South Korea to seat a national assembly that has a supermajority with the Progressive Party. 
and now the U.S. elections are afoot. And then next year, we have the South Korean general election for a new president. This is the timing that North Korea is recognizing and need to buy 80 days. Yeah, Clint, if, if I could maybe add a couple of things, I think that um, we are very much in a holding pattern um, between certainly between now and the presidential election. And then my guess is that North Korea will probably wait a while after that to see how a transition shakes out what messages the US president um, gives whoever that is. Um, in terms of their approach to North Korea, what personnel take up the key Korea related positions. And as, as General Brooks indicated, um, you know, what the constellation of South Korean politics is, whether or not we see the presidential election really affirm the um, swing toward the Progressive Party that we saw in the April elections of this year. Um, and so I think, you know, that's the, the sort of the political calculus in both South Korea and um, in the United States that North Korea will be watching closely. Um, but I think the other thing to, to notice is that COVID has really locked North Korea into some stasis and some isolation, maybe even more so than it than I think it probably wanted. Um, and so uh, I do think that COVID has had an impact in that it has led to, um, you know, the efficacy of sanctions enforcement has probably gone up, not because of things related to the sanctions, but because of, of travel restrictions and border security being tightened because of COVID. Um, and we've seen when North Korea has made references to redefectors or um, this most recent incident where it uh, killed a, a um, South Korean and and reportedly burned the body that the explanation again given was about border security and in in the midst of this covid crisis um, but that that pressure on north korea's external economic relations in particular cross border trade with china has combined with flooding typhoons natural conditions and a perennial food insecurity that characterizes north korea um, to really, I think, put pressure on Kim Jong-un's argument and claim that he's been able to achieve anything close to the Byungjin line. Um, they've got the, the nuclear part of this that I think that part is uh, Kim Jong-un can, can point to with more credibility right now than he can the, the economic prosperity and self-sufficiency half of the Byungjin um, line. And so, I, you know, I think where we're seeing the pressure uh, on the North Korean leadership is particularly to demonstrate that they can keep that balance, um, which is precisely the, the very thing that the sanctions were intended to say, no, you really can't have both equally. Um, but it, but COVID has really exacerbated that, that pressure on the regime. And so I think a lot of what we're seeing is an attempt to try to maintain some some semblance of the Byungjin line at a time when the economy and normal people's livelihood is, is really strained. Um, so I think we'll see stasis from the standpoint of a lot of external conditions, um, but the leadership maneuvering to try to deal with that to address the internal governance challenges that that, that poses. And I would expect that would continue at least through early next year. Thank you, Dr. Graydon. Yeah, that's that the 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 notion of stasis or a holding pattern, as you put it. I think that's exactly how I described it yesterday to a reporter that asked me about the current state of affairs, and I characterized it as sort of a suspended state of animation. You know, obviously things are continuing to happen, but with COVID and the natural, the natural uh, disasters, so to speak, and obviously uh, the election, they're sort of holding pat and seeing how things go as they deal with these intense constraints. Um, and thinking about uh, elections, right, and this is something that the North Korean leadership has constantly adjudicated in the past. The negotiations with one administration, uh, another administration comes in, often from a different party, and then it's like they start from scratch and things are, are totally it's sort of totally changed. Um, so this is part, I think, what motivates or disincentivizes any big moves at the moment, waiting to see what happens with the U.S. election. Um, some, some have speculated that they'll wait to see what happens and that potentially um, uh, one way or the other, whether it's a, a new administration with Biden or a second uh, Trump administration, 
they may do something to get uh, the U.S. leadership's attention to try to bring them back to the table or uh, to get them back on the sort of mental map. And so it it brings up the idea of potential escalation, um, which is uh, what my second question is about. When we see escalatory situations on the Korean Peninsula, which unfortunately seems to be the only time we pay attention to it, um, we hear that all options are on the table. It's a commonly expressed phrase. And it's often used during these periods, such as in 2017. But there's always considerable pushback of, of, to the idea of actually using force against North Korea. So I want to ask um, well, both of you, uh, General Brooks first, despite its rogue behavior, there's pushback against this. Why do you think this is? Are military options or responses to North Korea really a viable solution? Well, the use of the military instrument is a part of our total instruments of national power is always viable and I believe essential. So it, it becomes an, an anvil for uh, creating the right kind of pressure to cause North Korea to bend in a different direction. Uh, it can become a hammer to uh, very directly change the behavior of North Korea, but it's never effective if there's not a hand to wield it. And so there, there has to be something else. There has to be a fire to heat. There has to be a combination of, uh, of, of instruments that are brought to bear. I'm metaphoring here for instruments of US national power. We should never discount the potential use of the military. Indeed, uh, military capability when applied uh, creatively and uh, with some dexterity can create inflection points that create traction for diplomacy or create a deeper bite for economic activity or open a door to something that wasn't open before. That's how we need to think about this. It's not an either or, it's not a now and then later. You know, diplomacy now, military later, if diplomacy fails, that would be a recipe for disaster. It must be diplomacy and military and economic activities simultaneously and law enforcement and, and intelligence activities and information activities simultaneously applied. So are all options on the table? Yes, absolutely. Now, what does that mean? That means using the instrument deftly as I just talked about, sending signals with military instruments, reinforcing signals from other categories. And it also means the full array of military capability we possess. We should not believe that that's not true. It is true. Now, there are, there are many lines in that that we would not want to go to. And that's where I think the pushback comes from, Clint, when you ask, why, why is there so much pushback on this idea of all options being on the table? Because no one wants to see that happen. Now, we've seen what happens when nuclear countries clash with each other, like Pakistan and India, and how frightening that can be for the consequences should it escalate out of the control of either side. And a conflict that resumes on the Korean Peninsula between the ROC US alliance and North Korea, now possessing nuclear and uh, intercontinental missile range, means the problem is bigger than the Korean Peninsula. That makes it very different from the way it was in 1953 when fighting stopped. It's much bigger now. And I think the consequences of that bigger are very, very different to the world as it's currently established. Instability comes from that. Economic collapse may come from that in a number of places. Uh, underwriting of vessels in the Yellow Sea and the, the East Sea or the Sea of Japan will be different for, uh, for commercial enterprises. Things get impacted if shooting starts. And that's why I think there's a lot of pushback on it. But that does not mean that the option is not available. What we want is to have among the options, the ones that are less deadly, less destructive, and less likely to spiral out of control. We want those to be chosen. And they have to be available as options to national leaders in South Korea and the United States. Dr. Graydon's. Yeah, I would I would second that in that you know it is the responsibility of the American government and uh, which includes the the military the United States military to protect American lives and defend American interests and um, and so saying all options are on the table is simply the reality of of what the American government I think is is charged to do. Um, but that that doesn't mean, as General Brooks said, that that's the first place we go. That should be the you know the the idea that all options are on the table um, should not just mean the worst case option. 
or the, the most costly option is on the table. It really should mean all options. And that includes a combination of financial measures, economic measures, diplomatic tools, multilateral engagement, um, the whole array of instruments of, of national power. Um, you know, I, th I think we have to be very clear that we are talking about an, an adversary that over the course of the last five or so years has moved to the point of potentially being able to target the United States homeland. And that changes the calculus in terms of what's required for credible deterrent of, of North Korean action um, in some cases, right? And, um, and so that's a very, very serious threat that, that we all need to, to take seriously and think about how best to defend against. Um, and having a credible military deterrent is a very, very important tool in preventing escalation. Um, you know, at the same time, that also means we need to be creative and very thoughtful about pursuing these other tools and making sure that in situations that could escalate, that we understand what the off ramps are and how best to employ them. Um, that requires careful signaling. It is helpful, I think, to talk to the North Koreans when the North Koreans want to talk, uh, which is not all the time as they're blowing up of the inter-Korean liaison office uh, a few months back suggested. Um, you know, but there's a, there's a place and a time for, for dialogue, for economic pressure, and for a lot of other tools. Um, and so I think um, you know, what people are reacting to is that we really want to have a robust conversation about what all of the tools short of military force would would be or short of all an all out military conflict. Um, even in peacetime, the military has an important role to play on the Korean Peninsula, um, as General Brooks said, but it also means that we need to be paying attention to and engaging with questions of Korea policy when there's not an uptick uh, or escalation in military uh, activity. Um, so in some ways, this is, the I think, the ideal time to have these kinds of conversations when things are, are um, at a lull, not in the middle of a crisis, because that's when we have time and uh, the opportunity to think through different scenarios and the trade-offs associated with different policy options. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gordon. I love that last note. That literally speaks to why we hold the, we're holding these events and, and sort of pushing this dialogue is um, not just when things could potentially blow up. Let's talk about it now. Let's talk about it before then. Um, talk about it before we need it. Yes. Before we need it. So we have before a clear sense of what planners want to do. Yeah. Thank you. you. You sort of, you're preaching to the choir for me, but I'm happy you're preaching it to the public as well. Um, and you mentioned uh, both of you did sort of I, I at the start talked about the historical um, connection connectivity and, and why we have this commitment and its importance and you both rightly pointed out that not only do those historical ties remain but but the issue sets involved have become that much more paramount and that much more pressing and the costs of um, certain scenarios that much greater um, and so I want to turn the focus a little bit to the U.S. South Korea alliance itself, um, which both of you touched on. Um, and generally speaking, the U.S. mission on the Korean Peninsula is characterized as deterring uh, North Korean aggression, and in the case of deterrence failure, assisting in the defense of South Korea. This does sound uh, to maybe an ordinary American that, that the mission really is distant and over there. Uh, so why should Americans and, and Texans in particular care about what happens on the Korean Peninsula? And what, if any, is the larger value to U.S., to the U.S. and U.S. national interests of the U.S. ROC Alliance? And what would we stand to lose if if the alliance were to be severed or to dissipate? And I might direct this to Dr. Greitens first. <clears throat> yeah, sure. I think that's a, a really important question to, to think about. Um, I mean, first of all, I can, I can, we can talk about some of just the basic statistics, right? There are 2 million um, Korean Americans, give or take, in the United States. Um, South Korea is a really important trade partner to the United States, has been for a very long time. It's, you know, top five to 10 trading partner, depending on measurements and which year and, and what you're looking at. Um, so there are really important economic ties. There are really important cultural and people-to-people -people ties. Um, you know, I've talked about before my own family. Um, I'm obviously not Korean American, um, but my uh, I have a sibling who is a Korean adoptee, 
um, my younger sister. And so I can think of 25 people to 60 people, depending on my, you know, how, how you measure my extended family, right, who have been directly shaped um, by contact with the Korean Peninsula um, through, through my, my younger sister's adoption. Um, and so, you know, it's easy to it's easy to think, oh, it's a place over there. But there are hundreds of thousands of Americans who have studied, worked, served in um, Korea and many, many more who have never set foot in Korea, but whose lives have nevertheless been shaped by contact with Korean Americans, Koreans or um, some other contact with the, the Korean Peninsula. Um, and so I think it's really important to remember that that, that is a living history. It's a, a history um, that, uh, that is very much woven into the fabric of American lives in American cities today. Um, but the, the sort of the, the other piece of this is just the more strategic answer, which is that the United States has for decades now deemed it critical to its own security and prosperity that there be both peace and stability in the Western Pacific. Um, and so the United States has um, has always pursued policies uh, that are designed to keep its people safe, keep our country safe, both safe and prosperous, um, by by creating the conditions for peace, development, and stability in in East Asia. Um, and our, I think you know the American presence in Korea, while imperfect, uh, if you look over the course of decades of, of history, um, has has been um, I think executed with that as as an intent. Um, and it's one of the reasons why it's so important that South Korea is the thriving democracy that it is today. Um, that the U.S. Korea alliance has is now built on shared democratic principles. Um, and these people to people ties, but those are made possible in part by uh, the security guarantees that the US Korea alliance um, involves and the shared project that the US and South Korea have of peace on the Korean stability uh, Korean Peninsula and throughout the, I think the Indo the Indo Pacific region. Um, I guess I'd, I'd stop there and I'm happy to follow up. Yeah, Clint, uh, if I can just pick up on that, I certainly agree with, uh, with, with Sheena's points. You know, we've got a, a long relationship there, a relationship that was forged in blood that did not begin from being enemies or adversaries, uh, and it has endured through years, and the impact of it is evident. Anyone who goes to Seoul, Korea and lands at Incheon Airport can see the impact of a stable, long-term relationship with the United States. And it's their society, without a doubt, but helping to insulate them from the pressures of North Korea and the rest of the region during those years of rebuilding and regrowth and forming democracy and, and really letting democratic institutions seep in to overcome military dictatorship. All these things that happened during that time while we were standing beside them shoulder to shoulder. That's the heart of the alliance. It's a go together type of an alliance described in our national security documents as the linchpin of security in Northeast Asia. Okay, try, try to pull a linchpin out of a, a wheel on a cart and see what happens. The whole thing tumbles. So it may not be the biggest relationship that we have, but as a linchpin, it is a critical relationship that, that we would pay a price to pull out of. And so I, I would say that there's a lot to be lost if the alliance relationships should break or if the alliance system should break. Remember, we have seven alliances around the world and two of them are in Northeast Asia, Japan and Republic of Korea. Th that alliance system is part of what has created stability and prosperity and a degree of security uh, around the world, but especially in that region, it's so important to much of the world. That would be potentially at risk we have a resurgent China at the present time, which has strong muscles that are getting stronger all the time and a long history of uh, pushing smaller states on their borders uh, to be uh, obedient. And that's a term from some of their history. And they would engage in punishment for disobedience. That potential is always there for the shrimp that sometimes the Korean Peninsula is referred to as it sits between Japan Russia and China. Uh, 
all that is at stake. Our forward presence from a military perspective, forward presence on the Asian continent would be at stake should we reduce our presence uh, or to have no presence and only hope to respond in a time of crisis. Folks, we tried that. Look at 1948 to 1950. South Koreans can handle it. If something happens, we'll be there with our naval and air forces and reinforce them with that well, okay, maybe we invited some of the war that happened in 1950, at least in part, creating a sense of uh, opportunity or uh, adventurism on the part of Kim Il-sung and, and on Russia, for that matter. These are the things that are in play. I don't want to make this all sound like a terrible case that North, uh, North Korea is going to invade the day we leave and South Korea could never stand on its own. It, the conditions are not the same anymore. Remember, the city of Seoul is larger than the full population of North Korea now. That was not the case 40 years ago. The economies are not even comparable. You know, the 10th largest economy in the world and a basket case economy, which is North Korea. They're, they're not even in the same part. Their language isn't the same anymore because of the American influence on culture and dialect in South Korea. They don't speak the same language as North Korea anymore. So there's a lot at stake and there's a lot invested and it is worth it. The final point is we keep our promises. All right, we just, we just went through the anniversary of the Mutual Defense Treaty of 1953, signed on the 1st of October, 1953. Just past that anniversary a few days ago. We keep our promises. And that, that's what I would say about it. If I could just add one, um, one more note. I, um, I was looking up a, a quick figure to make sure that I, I gave everybody watching and listening the, the correct numbers here. Um, but when I first met General Brooks, it was um, on a trip to, uh, to Korea in the fall of 2017, so very close to three years ago. Um, and as part of that trip, one of the things that I did, this was part of a delegation um, from the state of Missouri, where I was serving as the first lady at the time. And, um, and it's interesting to note that, you know, General Brooks and I met in Korea then, and both of our roles are different, and yet we're still here talking about Korea, which I think speaks to the wide applicability and the enduring importance of some of these questions. Um, but what was incredibly moving at the time was to go and to lay a wreath in front of um, a wall that has a state by state list of uh, Americans who went and fought in Korea and who gave their lives in defense of um, of South Korea and um, and where I sit now in um, in Austin, um, we're a stone's throw from the Capitol, where there's a, a Korean War monument. And I, I just looked up the numbers, right? 300,000, almost 300,000 Texans served in uh, in the Korean War, and about 1,700 people um, died in the course of that conflict. And so. Um, you know, there are a lot of families who maybe it wasn't someone who served today, but whose grandparents um, or great grandparents may have been closely involved in the defense of Korea. And so when we talk about that, that shoulder to shoulder um, element and history that's written in blood, it's, it's, it's a very real thing. And again, it's something that I think it's, you know, it is abstract until it, you realize that it's it's a family member, a grandfather, a, um, you know, somebody in your family whose uh, life was a is a part of that tapestry, and it, and that comes down to today. Um, so I just wanted to add that I, you know I think those are those are the numbers that that we're talking about um, for for the state of Texas in particular, but every state has a story like that. Um, and recognizing that that human element of the mil forward military presence is also, I think, just a really important humanizing factor. Thank you, Sheena. Once again, you, you took literally the words out of my mouth. I was going to mention that specific number um, in the case of Texas, uh, not only the hundreds of thousands who served in the war, but the 1,779 who, who gave their lives in the Korean War. And uh, it continues to this day. I, I, um, as the general is aware, and Sheena, you likely are as well. Um, several armored brigade combat teams from the 1st Cavalry Division stationed in Fort Hood have, have uh, um, executed since 2015, I think, nine month rotational deployments on the peninsula. So that, that direct involvement uh, continues to this day from the state of Texas, not to mention all the people to people connections you mentioned, including 92,000 Korean Americans who who call the state of Texas their home. Um, I wanna turn a little bit 
to the, some of the nitty gritty of the U.S. force presence. It was it was mentioned, um, and I characterize it similarly as well. That it's sort of a the, the keystone in the arch, right? It's not the the largest commitment or the mo often characterizes the most important relationship, but if you pull that keystone out, the arch tumbles. Um, and so looking at uh, that that force presence of about 28,500 U.S. personnel. Does South Korea really need that number stationed there? And by now, some might ask, citing the very same factors that you mentioned, it's economic success and growth. Does Seoul really need those forces to defend itself against North Korea? And in fact, this is something that, that President Trump has said he wants to do is to, is to pull out or at least reduce the number of US forces there, particularly in light of ongoing difficulties in alliance cost-sharing negotiations, the SMA talks. Um, can he do that? What are the potential consequences as you both see them? Uh, and why have the two sides not settled on an equitable cost sharing agreement up to this point? Uh, General Brooks? Well, first on the number, uh, as you accurately described, we have troops from Fort Hood, Texas and Fort Riley, Kansas and other places where we have heavy brigades and where we have combat aviation brigades equipped with the Apache helicopter and where we have artillery units and signal units. Those are in different places of the United States. And they are rotational to Korea. In other words, they do a rotation. They belong to an installation or, or a unit that exists in the United States. They go for nine to, to 12 months. The heavy brigade actually is a 12 month. Some of the other ones are, are shorter for, for nine months. And then they return to their home base and maybe deployed to some other part of the world at a different point in time after that. So the 28,500 is the assigned number on Korea. That means people that people and units that don't exist anywhere else. They only exist on the peninsula. They don't have a home base in the United States. The rotational base on top of that brings the total up to about 30 to 34,000 at any given point in time. So the answer to the question is, do we need 28,500? No, you actually need more. That's why there are more there. That's why we have a rotational policy, because it takes more than that. What we chose to do several years ago, for example, I think it was 2005 or six, the last of the combat brigades on the Korean Peninsula, this is the forces that engage in direct assault. It was deployed to, uh, excuse me, it was reduced from, it, from the structure. Uh, there had been two before that, during my time when I was a, a commander over there in the 90s, one of them was deployed to Iraq, and then later we reduced the, the final one. So there's not, there's not a combat brigade stationed in Korea now. There's one rotating there. This is important to understand. Okay, so that's the first point. I, you know, I, I don't wanna take the numbers down further than that. The presence is principally Army and Air Force stationed there, forward deployed. And we will rotate additional forces several times during a given year from the United States Navy, the United States Marine Corps, and United States Special Operations Command. So we have a lot of forces that are coming through Korea at a given point in time for presence, for familiarity, for relationships, et cetera. There are issues clearly on what each country believes is the appropriate level of cost sharing. And frankly, that we have a standing agreement with South Korea speaks volumes to the nature of the alliance. And by the way, they pay more on uh, their money, you know, for, for their own defense than any other country in the world that we are related to as an ally, okay, by a long shot, somewhere between 2.7 and 2.8 percent of their gross domestic product, where the nearest other ally is somewhere around 1.9 or 2 percent and are being pushed. So South Korea is different from everyone else, but still there's controversy and, and discussion on what that amount should be. Uh, the issue of why it hasn't been resolved in my mind is candidly because of nationalism in both governments. And so nationalistic politics have ascended over the last several years. And as a result, that's a, that's a bit of a toxic mix when it comes to an alliance. Things that are about solving a problem together become dominated by national self-interest. And it's, that's, that's appropriate, that should always be part of the equation, but ultimately a conclusion is made when there's some degree of subordination of national self-interest for collective interest. And that has not been the case. So 
At this point in time, uh, neither country is yielding. And the uh, negotiations are pretty well stalled. There's not much progress being made. And it will be interesting to see how that unfolds, whether a new administration will be able to do that or not, or current administration moves in a different direction. Uh, that's hard to say. I, I just want to finish the point here by saying that uh, sometimes when we think about the bring our troops home, from a military perspective, and from a budgetary perspective, I'll address it from these two points, and not from a political perspective, the cost is much greater to maintain them in the United States, to ship them to Korea for that one year period of time instead of having them live there constantly. It's much more expensive. The labor costs are more expensive in the United States than they are in South Korea where labor is provided under this agreement by the South Korean government where construction doesn't require a, an appropriation of military construction. I guess the last year's National Defense Authorization Act was some $730 billion. Well, how much more does that need to be to have construction funded by the United States and conducted overseas where our troops would end up being? They've got to have a barracks. South Korea does that for us. It's not coming out of the US budget. So the, uh, the cost of coming home should not be misunderstood strategically, are, there are impacts to our presence in the United States and trying to have to fight our way into any place we would go. And economically, it is significantly more expensive and much more of a burden on our own economy. So I think that those points ought to be factored in and understood clearly. Well, General Brooks just mentioned the point that I was going to uh, I was going to to bring up. So let me um, let me pivot and just uh, add a, few, a very few short complementary points here. Um, you know, first on the the numbers, the, the exact numbers are are going to change over time. Um, Right, we're going to look at, we're going to have technological changes in the way that the US military fights wars to win. We're going to have a natural evolution in the complementarity of roles between the US military and the South Korean military. We've already seen all of that, right? And that's why these regular discussions and joint exercises and rotational presence and all of the things that General Brooks mentioned are so important um, because we need to make sure that that is in fact the um, the right structure and the right size force for the conditions on the Korean Peninsula and around the Korean Peninsula. Um, second, I do think it's really important to put South Korea's contributions into perspective. South Korea pays over 2.5% of its GDP um, or spends uh, more than 2.5% of GDP on uh, its own defense. It is well above the NATO threshold, right, that has been controversial um, of late, right? So, so there's no question that South Korea is meeting the obligations that, um, that we've put forth in other parts of the world. Um, and it is, in fact, much cheaper uh, for the United States to have um, to have forces in Korea where both infrastructure and much of the labor cost is funded by the South Korean government rather than being funded um, out of the U.S. budget. Um, so, so, so all of that is is to say, you know, I agree generally with the the, the assessment of why this has become a, re, a deadlock point. Um, but, but to me, all of those those factors really militate toward um, urgently resolving this as soon as possible. I think it's unfortunate that this has become uh, such an obstacle in the US-Korea alliance and that so much attention is being paid to the SMA and the cost sharing agreement as opposed to the other urgent national security challenges that the alliance needs to address and has to address. Um, and I guess the, you know, the last thing is just to say um, that I'd, I would having given all those facts and figures about, you know, the economic logic and the, the way the cost sharing structure actually works. Um, let me just also say that, um, you know, there are, there are long term benefits that we talked about to the US Korea alliance and having a durable alliance means that there are going to be specific individual transactions where if you take them out of context they're going to look like they don't go the us's way or frankly there are going to be pieces of that interaction that might look like they're not always accruing to south korea's interest right the very nature of an alliance which is a multi-year in this case multi-generational 
cooperation and partnership is that both sides give and take for the sake of the, the bigger project, which is shared security and shared stability. Um, and in this case, also shared democracy and freedom on the Korean Peninsula. Um, and so I think it would be a mistake to sort of look at this and say, okay, you know, in year 2020, did the economic logic accrue, you know, net to the United States benefit? Um, because it's not zero sum. Um, and it's also not uh, no single year and single issue, um, such as the financial cost, is going to be the right way to think about the alliance. Um, it, this is also an investment that the United States is making in its ability to deal with a rare event. Um, so in some ways, it's a little bit like insurance, right? You, you invest in something that is intended to either prevent or help you more capably deal with an eventual crisis. Now, we all hope the crisis in terms of conflict or an emergency on the Korean Peninsula never materializes, but we also want to make sure that we've invested what we need in the capability to deal with it. And that capability is not just technology, it's not just this, this sort of logistical, tactical, you know, operational, um, facility or ability of the United States military, it's also relational and about that, you know, the, the political um, and the cooperative uh, ability to, to operate with the South Korean military and the South Korean government. So I guess that's just, I guess I would just, I would just end with a word of caution on being too transactional um, about the alliance itself, because I think that misses the larger strategic picture, which involves this, this thinking of this as more of an investment um, to deal with and hedge against a, a, a rare and, and catastrophic event that we hope doesn't come, but we nevertheless need to prepare for. Thank you, both of you. Those were incredibly comprehensive answers. The only thing, the only thing that I would add on to that is, um, and it's been sort of alluded to, um, in terms of long-term investment, the, the U.S. force presence has been there for the entirety of South Korea's national existence, but for one year, and that was June of 1949 to the outbreak of the Korean War. And so I think when we look at it in that longer sweep of history, of course, the numbers have been adjusted and drawn down over time. But we, when we look, about it, look at it in that long sweep of history, some folks ask, well, we've been there for so long, it's about time to leave. My, my perspective is there's a reason we've been there that long. And having been there that long and for the security architecture having had been characterized by that presence for so long is not something that you want to precipitously um, sort of fiddle with. Um, is my own editorializing there. Um, I have, as my speakers know, an assortment of other questions, but I want to stay true to um, the sort of timeline that I laid out at the start and turn to Q&A. We have quite a few questions lined up, um, some of which do touch on questions that I was going to ask, so that's good. Uh, the first question I want to, I want to turn to is from uh, William Inboden, who is the, uh, the director of the Clement Center. And he writes, uh, a few years ago, Jim Steinberg and Kurt Campbell co-authored a great book on presidential transitions, which pointed out that our adversaries often see the presidential transition window as a time to make mischief or provoke crises. Since the US might have a change of administration coming up in uh, November to January, do any of our speakers worry about an increased likelihood of, of Kim, Kim Jong-un engaging in destabilizing behavior in that window? I'll, I'll defer to our speakers' two-fingered interventions on that. I see them both unmuted yeah, at the we'll same time. So. Shana, go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, I, that's a, a terrific question. And um, the answer is that I would think of it, uh, I, I do think there's a possibility that that, that would happen. Um, in this case, I think that the, the COVID crisis and some of, the, some of the things we're seeing in North Korean domestic politics um, may keep more of a lid on that. Now, that may be hopeful thinking and, and wishful thinking is seldom a good idea when it comes to questions of North Korea planning. Um, so what I would look for North Korea to potentially be doing prior to the advent of a new administration is to make whatever moves it, think it, need, it thinks it needs to make either to lock in capabilities that it doesn't want to get rid of. So if there, it, so, so for example, if there's a test that 
North Korea feels like it needs to do to perfect a particular part of its military technology, whether that's a missile or a piece of its nuclear arsenal, um, then I might expect to see that because there's a, a window where um, everyone's a little bit distracted and there's a new, an old team leaving, new team coming in. Um, so I think there's, there's that technical rationale potentially for for um, some sort of provocation or, or testing during that window. Um, but the other thing is that North Korea wants to set the bargaining table for the next administration, right? And so generally, whatever it can do to solidify a position going into, if it, if it expects that a new administration, whether it's a second Trump administration or a, a new Biden administration, will re-engage on um, on the question of North Korea and try to make some progress, then North Korea will potentially try to put itself in a favorable um, favorable environment or favorable uh, bargaining position. And so that may mean doing something that substantively moves the, the negotiating table to their favor, um, which would again, probably be something, something very similar in terms of testing. Um, you know, that, so I, so I think that's, those are the kinds of things that I would potentially be looking for. Um, but again, I think North Korea also recognizes that there's a lot of uncertainty and instability and that, uh, you know, North Korea has shown an ability to sometimes dial it down um, when, uh, when that serves their interest. So, um, you know, as I think it was, I think General Brooks started out by saying we should always expect the unexpected with North Korea. Um, and that's more or less how I would ap approach this. I don't necessarily have strong priors, but if North Korea decides to pursue something provocative, those are the motivations that I would be looking for and, and thinking about um, as, as driving North Korean behavior. And I'll just join in on that. Uh, I, I think the question is a legitimate one, uh, especially if we cast the net broadly about adversaries, challengers, and opportunists globally, then certainly I, I think several will find windows of opportunity at the present time and into the, the future up through the time of the inauguration. And maybe they're engaged already, as we've seen before. So I wouldn't narrow it down to North Korea. Now, having said that, North Korea specifically within that, uh, I've, I've operated under the view that North Korea does make decisions based on their own interests. Uh, amazing idea there they're not reflexive, they're thoughtful about it. So in the transition between the two governments of the alliance, the South Korean government by way of impeachment, uh, and then the US government by way of election, that was a window of opportunity as well where this question came up frequently. Will North Korea engage in some cycle of provocation here in the November to January timeframe, 2016 to 2017. Different views on that. Some thought that yes, they probably would. Uh, some of us, and I, I was of the view then and I'm of the view now, why would they need to? They've got a burning fire in South Korea. The attention is focused on that. South Korea's attention is there and they're having difficulty with that. And North Korea benefits when South Korea has difficulty. And the United States was in a significant transition as well. There had been campaign rhetoric, and they saw the result of the election in November 2015 that indicated that there may be a new direction that the US government would take, potentially a harder line following a, a, a government that was frustrated with North Korea and had kind of run out of, run out of mileage on being able to move forward with, with North Korea at the time. That didn't mean that North Korea needed to engage in provocations immediately. What they did was they waited for the impeachment to occur, waited for the new government to seat, and then began to test both governments. So they were, very, they were thoughtful about this. Uh, we started seeing a significant amount of activity in April 2017. Okay, and obviously it went through that season that we know that ended on the 29th of November 2017. But they had been testing before that at a fast rate. There was a stop in a period of time when it could have been the opposite. So I think in this case, the 80-day campaign is a way to focus attention. There is some risk to the 80-day campaign. I saw the, the comment from Glenn Ford there, who I have great appreciation and respect for. Uh, there may be more people out working if it's done in a, 
classic way, but it also may be symbolic where a certain number of people who are out and it's extrapolated to a much larger campaign that isn't. But the point here is that North Korea, I think, will want attention to not be brought on them yet. They don't want to galvanize policy for the U.S. administration in particular, and they want to put the South Korean administration on hold, which is why the Kaesong liaison complex was blown up. That was pressing the hold button. We're not going to talk to you now. Sometime in 2021, when you really want to get some accomplishments before your election, we're going to talk because then North Korea would have greater leverage. If they were to take action now in a provocative way, they would turn international attention back to them, which they don't need at the moment, and they would ratchet up potentially greater pressure against them, creating solidarity for those nations enforcing UN Security Council resolutions. They don't need that either. They, they want a tattered resolution, not a tightly woven fabric. And so the timing is not right for North Korea to engage in a provocation. Uh, if we see some sort of really harsh rhetoric coming out from the U.S. government in the next 90 days, or I'd say, to overlap uh, Kim Jong-un's 80-day window, then that's perhaps a different story. But that is not likely to be the case. Last point here is North Korea may also be waiting to assess they, of course, will have some underlying assumptions. Would a Trump administration, if reelected, continue in the same direction? Would a Biden administration, if elected, resume where 2017 January ended? And they want to know, is, is it going to be more of what we know or is it going to be a different direction? And the answer, I think, is the table is open and either administration, either candidate, uh, once elected, could go in a very different direction than either of the two previous administrations. So we're not it, it, it all rigid in that regard. North Korea wants to stay tuned, and we should too. Um, yeah, thank you for your responses. Again, very comprehensive. Um, and you raise the important point, of course, that the North Koreans, uh, sometimes people miss this because of the, the sort of caricatured image we have of the regime. Um, they're quite calculated and thoughtful, thoughtful about the actions they take. Um, and oftentimes, as Sheena, as you alluded to, the testing is, is for technical reasons, right? It's not necessarily sending that as external signal, it's to, to refine their capabilities, which of course does send a signal and can be worrisome, but it may not be bellicose in the, in the sense that it's interpreted. Um, I wanted to turn to another question, which again aligns with one I was gonna ask and moves in a direction uh, that you were headed there, um, General Brooks, which is by John uh, Fay, a large component of, of the U.S. commitment to Korean affairs is rooted in security. What strategies would you suggest to incentivize the DPRK's return to negotiations and then to incrementally move toward denuclearization, noting that we shouldn't compromise leverage too quickly? So I guess whether it's a Biden administration or a second Trump administration, what's the best way to try to incentivize the North Koreans to return to the negotiating table and move toward that ever elusive goal of denuclearization? Well, I'll, I'll chime in first. Uh, I, I'm carrying still the views that I had while I was in command and acknowledge that I'm not present on the peninsula. So I can't feel it the same way that I used to be able to feel it. I, I do believe, uh, and I've talked about this, uh, with some regularity, that there are two primary concerns. The first is what I call a cultural conundrum. There are different approaches culturally to getting to denuclearization. That has to be resolved. Uh, they're fundamentally diametrically opposite. And this is the relationship among denuclearization actions, trust and relationship. For the West, it very clearly is a desire to see action which can then lead to trust, which could then lead to a new relationship. You know, that we're no longer hostile, that there can be an end of hostilities, an end of war, a peace treaty, et cetera. For North Korea and South Korea, I would submit, it's the opposite. North Korea has already said they're going to release their, their nuclear weapons and, and disarm. And while they have plenty of reasons to not do it, including just being liars if they choose to do so, they may also have indeed committed to that, but now what they're looking for is a changed relationship first, which then opens the door to trust that this is going to be different this time, and then opens the door to 
fulfillment of the actions already promised. These are opposites. And the approach is going to have to be reconciled. I think South Korea can play a big role in this in helping to do the cultural translation. But candidly, it has to be done from the perspective of thinking about it geopolitically and not nationalistically. And right now, I think that there's a nationalistic pull in South Korea, as there is in the United States, but a nationalistic pull that can distort the advice that South Korea gives to the United States and causes then the United States to be less willing to accept the advice. Okay, so this cultural conundrum has to be addressed first on how best to approach North Korea to get them to open the door and to come to the table. Uh, mutual respect is a part of that. Uh, one of the scholars on the, the network with us today uh, who had contact with North Korea shared with me on a visit through South Korea back in those days it's really important. North Korea has to come to the table with their hand out, not their hands up. And if they're pushed into a position where they have to sub, uh, uh, subjugate their pride, their face, they won't come. They'll starve first. And so if we want to see progress, we've got to, got to move in that direction. The second aspect of this beyond the cultural conundrum is a view that an incentive needs to be done with a different kind of control. So clearly, Kim Jong-un wants the economic part of his Byung-jin line or Byung-jin policy to be the ascendant one. It's more important to him than the nuclear weapons. The nuclear weapons were supposed to be a lever to accelerate that. In fact, it, it spoiled it. But that's still what he's after. He needs to deliver a North Korea that his father and his grandfather could not deliver. And he's done that in part with the nuclear weapons, but he has not done it with the economic pursuits that he wanted. So economic incentives that are controlled a, a let's call it an escrow account where money is put in by the international community. North Korea can see it. It's visible to the international community to see what has been put in, but it cannot be released until behaviors consistent with progress occur. And that's to keep North Korea from pocketing the great P bank that they see building up. Maybe an approach like that could be another way to try to incentivize the behaviors of North Korea where they really might have a chance of pursuing the economic part of their being Jin line if they don't have a dual track of holding the weapons. Let me offer a couple of related thoughts on some of the obstacles to denuclearization. Um, I must admit I am not particularly optimistic about, uh, about either how easy it would be to get there or North Korea's own willingness to, to really truly at the end contemplate um, relinquishing its, its nuclear arsenal. Um, and let me put this, let me, let me go through this in, in terms of calculations in two places. One is Seoul and one is, um, is Washington, and then I'll come back to Pyongyang at the end. Um, so even if you, then the reason I'm doing that is that even if you have a, a North Korea, as General Brooks said, that is hypothetically willing to relinquish nuclear weapons, um, the United, the, the chief demand, as we understand it um, from the reporting I've seen that North Korea made at its summits in Southeast Asia with, um, with President Trump had to do with sanctions relief. And sanctions relief is now complicated on the US side and globally. Um, for one, I think, fairly specific reason, which is that the United States has now imposed sanctions on North Korea, not just via the executive branch, but via Congress. And those sanctions include not just security and proliferation related sanctions, um, but also measures that have been applied on human rights grounds. Uh, and that include the family leadership of the, the Kim regime right, um, include members of the, the Kim family. Um, and so even if you had sort of, you know, best case scenario, you had alignment between Seoul and Washington and an administration that was really good at diplomacy and really willing to make significant concessions to North Korea. And sort of so, so like the best case scenario, not from a normative standpoint, but like a most likely scenario for, for getting a deal. Um, then you would still have this potential spoiler role that the US Congress could play on human rights grounds. Um, and it is hard for me to envision a North Korea that is going to be simultaneously willing to do what it would need to do on, a, on the proliferation front and 
verifiably change some of its internal human rights practices. Um, and so the reality is that unless you also have Congress in the right frame of mind or thinking that a deal is, is worth, um, worth sort of amending US law, what is now in US law in terms of the human rights designations, um, then I think you're, you're gonna run into more roadblocks than we sometimes anticipate on the US side. Um, at, at least that, that very real potential is there and um, I think has to be factored in. Now, if, you know, if the president got a, a great deal, whoever the president is, uh, you, he could probably persuade Congress. Um, but I just wanna flag that because I think we often forget that there's now a, a, the statutory landscape is different than it was under President Obama and that it involves sanctions, not just for security and proliferation issues, but also for human rights. Um, and, and that by tying those issues together, North Korea um, would potentially have to move simultaneously on both. And I, I just see that as a very, very difficult thing to ask them to do. Um, it's the right thing, right? Um, we all want human rights to be um, part of the conversation on the Korean Peninsula, but if we're being, you know, sort of re like trying to assess the likely, um, you know, move and counter move on North Korea's um, part, that seems like a, a significant obstacle to me. Second is that you know there there is um, there is a presidential election coming up in in um, in South Korea, and so we don't have a lot of time after the U.S. election before we could potentially have another president in. South Korea. And so depending on the party alignment, inter-Korean policy could start looking quite different. Um, and the way that I would think about it is that one of the dividing lines in the approach to, to Korea, I agree with, with General Brooks that, that both sides tend to see relationship building as coming first, right? So you had President Park Geun-hye had trust politic, right? This, this idea of, of trust politics. Um, and uh, the Moon administration has sim similarly emphasized relationship building. Um, but I think the two parties do differ in terms of how they see the Kim regime and its relationship to building inter-Korean relations or, un or eventual unification. In that I think that the progressives tend to see uh, engagement with the Kim regime itself as the only path to unification and conservatives tend to view engagement with the Kim regime as, or the, at least the Kim regime itself as an obstacle to unification. Um, and depending on which of, and it, it, it's probably both, to, to a certain extent, but depending on which one you emphasize, the thrust and the tempo and the way that inter-Korean relations relate to, to, to the US-Korea alliance can be very different. Um, so I also just wanted to flag that that to me is a big unknown um, and it could similarly make it harder to get the kind of alignment of multiple moving pieces that I think you'd need to get for a deal to come into place. You raise a really important point there, Sheena, the, the congressional side, and this is something that we're thinking a lot about Congress's role in this. And, and as you rightly mentioned, the much more complex statutory landscape that we now face. I mean, Congress played a spoiler role during the agreed framework period in the 1990s. It's even more complex now and potentially even more difficult considering partisanship these days. Um, so not only is our attention episodic, but even in the best of circumstances, there are so many moving parts. Um, not only for our own domestic politics, but as you mentioned, South Korea's own elections and particular shifts uh, in party alignment. Um, I want to, as I said before, uh, we're gonna we're gonna put out some polling questions for our audience. Uh, we would really love to to have your responses to these. So if you wouldn't take wouldn't mind taking a moment to respond. The first one is just yes or no, um, but the other two, two and three, allow for for multiple responses. Um, so it's not really either or in the second in, in numbers two or three. So please take the time um, to, to respond to those. Um, and I want to turn to, I want to turn to another question. Excuse me, I'm sorry, my, my colleague corrects me. The third one uh, is not multiple option, it's a single option. Only question number two is multiple responses. Um, my mistake. Um, I want to turn to, to bring two questions together from the Q&A which talk about the, the China angle, which was something that I was gonna ask about. Um, and the first one um, is from Max von Bargen, which is, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing your name. How does the China DPRK relationship 
combined with our broader issues with China in the Western Pacific affect the prospects for long-term U.S. engagement and U.S. interests in the Korean Peninsula? And furthermore, um, adding to that uh, Nick Romanov's question, Romanow, excuse me, what is the state of relations between China and South Korea? Would the South Koreans be willing to join a U.S.-led coalition to balance against Chinese influence? Sort of a lot of questions in one. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, the relationships with China are very important to all of this calculation. Uh, China is a big neighbor. China is one of the five countries surrounding, if you will, North Korea. And the other others, of course, being Russia, Japan, United States, and South Korea. China has uh, an outsized impact on the decrepit economy of North Korea, uh, more than 90% of the trade flows in or uh, did flow in to North Korea is, is Chinese related. Um, so at the same time, China has a great deal of frustration with North Korea and North Korea pushed their buttons in many ways, particularly with the fifth and then the sixth nuclear test, a little bit less so with the intercontinental ballistic missile development, which they found frustrating and angering, but not a direct threat. And maybe even valuable and irritating to the United States, but not to the point where the United States would now consider unilateral action. North, uh, uh, China did not want to see war on the Korean Peninsula. No war, no nukes, no instability were their three no's at the time. So even now with the enforcement of sanctions, which China voted for on two occasions as part of the unanimous votes on the United Nations Security Council, to impose these very tough sanctions that Sheena talked about, even the domestic aspect of that with the executive branch and the legislative branch, both coming down with a, a very tight clamp, but the international community as well did so. And China was part of that. At the same time, China always acts in its own interest. If it doesn't feel advantage, it's not going to take an action. So they don't feel advantage in choking out North Korea right now, for example so that they truly clamp down on their economy in such a way that North Korea gives up, brings their hands up to bring that point back from, from earlier. But China hasn't done that. China could do more of that, but has not. So thus they're deciding their own interests. Now the geopolitical tectonic plate shift that's ongoing is also central to China. And that then causes calculations to be different among the other actors in the region. North Korea, China is a, a balancing act. North Korea does not want to be a vassal state of China, doesn't want to be uh, so dependent upon China, which hasn't helped them very much lately. Russia finds value and irritation in the alliance system and potentially seeing it roll back. They'd love to see the United States engage in retrenchment back into its territorial coastlines. Uh, withdrawing of its Navy from the region. And as a result, they're choosing to engage in friendly relations with China. It's not a deep relationship, but it's a relationship of convenience that serves interests for Russia. So we see Russia acting in a spoiling role there in its relationship, supportive of China and its maneuvers. Japan now having three threats, uh, one from North Korea, since North Korea can reach them, uh, one, an existing one from the end of World War II in the, the Kuril Islands to the north of the archipelago, and a, a increasingly militarily active uh, People's Liberation Army in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea. These areas are along the archipelago of Japan, and it causes Japan to have to recalculate its approach to maintaining security and defense. And then finally, with South Korea being so close a neighbor of, of China, but having one ally, that is the United States, they're not an ally of China, uh, would they engage in an alliance action against China? I think South Korea would do everything it could to try to avoid a conflict with China and would be in a very difficult position to just jump in on one way or another. And that's regardless of political party that's in power at a given point in time. 
And so it's a, challenge, it's a challenging position. At the same time, South Korea is very clear, and they've been clear in both administrations that I served. They have one ally, one. That's not Japan, that's not China, it's the United States. And they have high expectation of the United States to not put them in a position where they've got to choose between their economy and a relationship with the United States. And as a result, they've had to play a cagey game on things like the quad. I know there was a question about that. South Korea is not in the quad for this very reason. It, it's difficult for South Korea to choose sides now against China, but they have chosen. They, they're in a mutual defense treaty with the United States. And asking again is exacerbating to the, the politics of South Korea. Uh, so how we work through this is difficult. And I would add to that, given the tension between South Korea and Japan, politically and socially, there is a, a difficulty for South Korea to immediately embrace a free and open Indo-Pacific, which the United States and Japan and other members of the Quad, Australia and India, have really aligned themselves toward. Is that something South Korea wants to do, is align itself in something that looks like some sort of Pacific alliance? Is that in their interest? And South Korea has a very difficult time making that choice. All of these are related to China. And so how we think about uh, national engagements toward China, cooperative engagements toward China, not to encircle them, not to, to precipitate war, that's not needed for anyone, but to help China emerge in such a way that it's not so destabilizing as it is right now. That's what I think is afoot at the present time. Yeah, what I hear increasingly from uh, colleagues and friends who uh, are abroad in the Indo-Pacific right now, since it's, it's been a few months since I've been in the region myself with all the, the travel restrictions, um, is, is that there's a reluctance to have to choose in the black or white sense, right? So the United States is clearly the preferred security partner and there's a mutual defense treaty that South Korea takes very, very seriously across, across administrations. Um, at the same time, it's impossible, I think, to escape the reality um, for Korea, as, as for many other countries in Asia, of the importance of China to those countries, econo uh, their, their economy and their economic prosperity. Um, and so generally, I think the United States um, would be, you know, doesn't want to be in a position where it's asking people to choose between their economy and their security. Right, we, we, we want our allies to be able to have both. Um, and we want them to be able to have the, the freedom to make those decisions as they see fit because that's integral to the, the heart of the, the sort of democratic project and this idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific, at least as I, as I understand it. Um, so I think the, you know, the United States has typically tried to frame this as we aren't forcing you to choose the United States, we are setting up an architecture where countries in Asia are free to make their own choice. Now, that also means making it free of Chinese coercion. Right? And so sometimes the United States is, has taken a more active role, including in, in um, cases with, with Korea. I'm thinking in particular of the, the THAAD uh, debate in, in Korea and China's response to that, um, where it has tried to provide support to allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific so that they don't feel compelled or coerced to align with China, right? And that's an important distinction um, is, you know, rather than compelling people to choose the United States, making that available as an option, but also preventing countries from being coerced into choosing China exclusively as well. Um, and I think it's really important that the United States, because of these dynamics in Asia, um, on the Korean Peninsula, and much more broadly, frames its approach to the region not just as a coalition against, right? I, I share the assessment that that's not where South Korea wants to be. Um, it, uh, it has made it very clear what the U.S. Mutual Defense Treaty and the, the U.S.-Korea alliance mean. Um, but rather than presenting it, this as something that is exclusive and against China, I think it's really important to prevent, present a vision of what the U.S. and its allies and partners are for, right? Um, and that, that for has to include economic prosperity, 
um, and there is going to be some role for China in the Indo-Pacific when we talk about economic prosperity. There's just no way to get around that at present. Um, and I think the, the other question about China has to do with um, you know, the second order effects of having confrontation with China and at the same time asking China, which the US typically has done, um, to do more or provide an environment conducive to bringing North Korea to the negotiating table in terms of sanctions enforcement and political encouragement. Um, and, uh, you know, we heard a lot about North Korea in the early period of the Trump administration. We have heard less since the, the summits um, and we have seen instead much more focus in the Indo-Pacific on tensions with China. Right? And I'm not suggesting one was substituted for the other, just that um, that we've seen an acceleration of tension in the US-China relationship um, at a time when it also seems like the administration may have concluded that they weren't they weren't necessarily going to get anywhere right away on North Korea, um, whether they asked China to do anything or not. So there was a decision to just go ahead and focus on these issues with China as the um, uh, the sort of the central player in the um, strategic landscape when America looks at the Indo-Pacific. Um, but I, I think there's going to be an open question uh, for a new administration. How many of these tensions and this sort of um, I would say selective decoupling, to borrow the phrase from Ambassador Branstead's op-ed, um, right? This idea of selective decoupling that that has already occurred in the U.S.-China relationship, right? They were never fully coupled. They're not going to be fully decoupled. But in the new landscape that we have, where there's some selective decoupling, um, what effect does that have on how we see China's role vis-a-vis -vis the Korean Peninsula? Um, and it's not clear to me um, that either administration right now has fully updated its strategy on North Korea and it's thinking about how to handle North Korea to deal with the, the way that tensions have played out very, very quickly um, on the US-China front, right? That's, that's a set of, you know, US-China tensions and issues have moved quickly. I mean, I follow this stuff very closely and I have trouble keeping up with exactly where the landscape is some days. Um, so I don't expect necessarily that, that um, the U.S. administration would be perfectly up to date, um, or that the you know the Biden folks would would have a fully fleshed out plan, especially if they plan on changing China policy. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that typically the United States has seen a significant role for China in altering North Korea's behavior, right? Um, and so, depending on uh, what's going on with China, there may be real second order effects on how we assess the tools and the ability of different countries to put leverage on North Korea itself in an, in a new administration when you know the US comes back to thinking about these questions. Um, so I, that's not an answer. It's kind of trying to define the problem that I think either and it, a new administration would need to solve whoever it ends up being. That's that's put well. It's you know it may not be a direct answer, but it 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 sets the scene well for the nature of the problem or problems. Right, selective and confusing decoupling. So it's we need to get a sense of this. Um, I had I to call ask, it something, otherwise we'd be here all day. Yeah, <laughs> I want I want to ask my my colleague Ileana with the time we have left if she could if she could publish the uh, the results of the poll we we put out there. Um, and I, this is unnecessarily brief, but I want to get it in because I was going to ask it myself. Uh, Lieutenant General Chunenbaum asked, what are your views on South Korea possessing its own nuclear weapons or its own nuclear deterrent? Um, if, I could, if I could ask both of our respondents to give a, a quick response to that. I'm sorry to curtail responses, but. Yeah, I'll give you a short one. Uh, I think it's ill-advised. Uh, first, it reflects a lack of trust in extended deterrence and uh, nuclear umbrella, the reliability of the United States. That's what it's reflective of. But to pursue the nuclear weapons would open more cans of worms than it would address uh, domestic political issues all the way up to non-proliferation issues, et cetera, et cetera. And it wouldn't change very much. So if you don't want a nuclear weapon used on the peninsula, why would you have one? 
so I don't think it's well advised. And I agree. I, I would say also that's the case for Japan. Yeah, I would add two points to that. First, I don't see it as um, a game changer in terms of the defense of the Korean Peninsula um, and of South, the defense of South Korea. Um, and so that that's kind of my first order concern. Um, second, you know, the, the question is, would that somehow even the playing field such that um, Korea, you know, you could, it would actually jumpstart or kick off a, a different conversation about denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. And the way I read North Korean statements, I don't think it would. Um, because I think when North Korea talks about denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, it also means the end of extended deterrence um, and the US uh, extended deterrence shield um, uh, for South Korea. And so I, I don't think, um, I, I'm not convinced that that, that would um, address what North Korea has already sort of interpreted for us that it's looking for, which is more a change in, in US policy. Um, again, you know, there's a really important role for the ROK, um, but I'm, I'm uh, like General Brooks, I see some downsides and I'm not convinced that it would actually provide the positive leverage that we might hope it would. Uh, thank you both for those, those concise responses. Um, I, I see our poll, I, the, the percentages have disappeared, but I see that uh, most people, a majority, do not look at the candidates' views on North Korea as deciding their vote one way or another, which is, which is what I would expect. But I'm continually surprised that actually the numbers that said it would were as high as they were at 48%. I think that may be the result of a self-selecting sort of audience that does focus on Korean issues that's joined us today. And it looked like most folks also favored some combination of continued deterrence and diplomacy, as well as some additional economic sanctions maybe, but nobody favored military strikes, which is probably a good thing. Um, and on the last one, folks looked at alliances as, as valuable, worth maintaining, but we do need to critically reevaluate them as we move along. Um, well, we've, we've reached um, our, our final time. I, before I pass things back to, to Paul, in the Clement Center. I just want to thank our speakers again. Um, this is 90 minutes. This has been 90 minutes, which is a long time to be on a Zoom. Um, 30 minutes longer than we normally we normally do, but clearly we used all the time um, and we could, have we could have kept going, I'm sure. Um, and I really want to thank the Clement Center again. Um, I've been looking for an opportunity to return to the Clement Center. I presented a paper there on uh, President Jimmy Carter's abortive troop withdrawal three years ago now and I've been trying to plot my return and this is a virtual return but at least it's a start uh, to, to, to sort of maintaining that relationship. So thank you again to the Clement Center. Thank you to all uh, our attendees. Uh, thank you Dr. Greitens. Uh, thank you um, General Brooks and to KDVA as well for your ongoing uh, sort of partnership and assistance. Uh, Paul. Great. Thanks Clint. Thanks uh, to each one of you and thanks to you our audience for tuning in and before we sign off I'd like to bring your attention to our next event on Thursday. So that's October 8th, just two days from now at 12.15. Uh, registration and sign on will begin at 12 o'clock. Michael Kimmage, uh, the distinguished history professor at Catholic University will present his book, The Abandonment of the West, The History of an Idea in American Foreign Policy. We look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again for tuning in. Thank you everybody. <laughs>